Writing in the 18th century, the era of absolutism, a period of consolidation for the nations of Europe, Voltaire quipped that the Holy Roman Empire, the body politic which then encompassed modern-day Belgium, Czechia, Germany, Austria and parts of France, Poland and Italy, was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Such an observation was predicated on the peculiarities of this particular entity, a patchwork quilt in the centre of Europe. It was something corresponding to Germany in geography, yet was in no way a German nation, but a Germany of many Germanies, from the principalities of Hesse and Württemberg, the bishoprics of Mainz and Cologne, to the Kingdom of Prussia, and the Emperor's own domains in Austria and Bohemia. The Emperor's authority over the princes gradually diminished throughout the centuries. Indeed, the princes would spend a considerable part of the 18th century at war with one another. The Emperor, therefore, lacked imperium in the literal sense, the power to command. It was an empire that was nominally Roman, so why was it mainly situated in Germany, while it was the Pope who ruled in Rome? Moreover, the Peace of Westphalia and the Peace of Augsburg, the cornerstones of the German liberty, the legal settlements which kept the peace internally, allowed the princes to pick and choose the Christian denominations of their subjects. The emperor was Catholic, but the princes were Catholics, Lutherans and Calvinists. A superficial glance would seem to confirm Voltaire's observation. Shortly following his death, the empire would undergo a major reorganisation, before the emperor himself would dissolve the empire by his own initiative. The Holy Roman Empire was a misnomer, and a moribund misnomer at that. Or was it? The last emperor dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, not because it was destined to die, but to prevent its revitalization under a different dynasty and a different nation. It can be said that the empire was sacrificed to spare the Austrian Habsburgs, the titular Holy Roman Emperors, the embarrassment of a formal submission to Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, a man who consciously styled himself after Charlemagne, arguably the first Holy Roman Emperor. The error of Voltaire was to deny the substance of what the empire symbolised, universal dominion over Europe and broader Christendom, a symbol that outlasted even Napoleon. Complications arise when trying to reconcile the ideal of the Holy Roman Empire with a historical trajectory which amounts to a millennium of decline from the moment of its inception. It was an idea never fully realised, yet an idea that never died. Such nuance is required to spare us from both extremes of imperial apologetics and Voltaire's reductionism. In Wagner's Rheingold, the introduction to his grand operatic saga, The Ring of the Nibelungen, Wotan contracts the giants Fasolt and Fafner to build for him Valhalla, a heavenly palace, a fitting seat for the king of the gods. But he must pay a high price. The giants kidnap the goddess Freya, and with her the source of the gods' perpetual youth. Meanwhile, a certain Albrecht has constructed a talisman, a ring of terrible power, which he uses to enslave the race of the Nibelungen to mine precious metals. Wotan and his accomplice, the god Loga, trick Albrecht, forcing him to offer his hoard of treasures to the giants as payment. Reluctantly, Wotan is forced to surrender Albrecht's ring to the giants as well. With such a weapon beyond his reach, the king of the gods has sown the seeds of his own destruction and that of his race in the foundations of his very palace. His commitment to Fafnir, etched forever on his spear, a source of Wotan's power and the instrument which most constrains him. 
Valhalla is constructed on a contradiction in that it both glorifies and ultimately condemns. Wagner's Wotan might as well serve as a parable of Charlemagne and the foundation of the Holy Roman Empire. The true origin of the entity known as the Holy Roman Empire is up to speculation, but there are key moments we can observe. The term itself, Holy Roman Empire, Sacrum Imperium Romanum, Heiliges Romanisches Reich, dates from the reign of Frederick I Barbarossa, rather ironically, at a moment when the legitimacy of the HRE was most hotly contested between the Emperor and the Pope. The term then was made as a claim to authority rather than as a statement of fact. If one is to take the term literally and interpret holy as a synonym for Christian, then a Roman Christian polity claiming universal dominion or imperium has its informal origins in the reign of Constantine and consolidated later under Theodosius the Great when Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. From the outset, the idea of a universal Holy Rome conflicted with the political reality, for a united Christian Roman Empire stretching from Britannia to Syria would not survive the reign of Theodosius. The empire would be permanently divided, and the western half would not survive a century after the division. The physical division of the empire mirrors the early schisms of Christendom after the councils of Theseus and Chalcedon. For the first time, Rome and the universally acknowledged primus inter pares of the Christian prelates, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, lay outside the direct jurisdiction of the Roman Emperor, residing in Constantinople. Belisarius's conquests would see Italy restored to the empire, but such success would prove fleeting, as within two centuries of Justinian's imperial restoration, the Muslim Caliphate had reached the walls of Constantinople itself. The empire seemed on the brink of extinction. By the 8th century, the emperor and the pope were linked only by a thin strip of land connecting the city of Rome to the port and formal western imperial capital of Ravenna, the exarchate of Ravenna. The Germanic tribe, the Lombards, had undone most of the conquests of Belisarius in Italy, and the emperors themselves showed little interest in preserving their Romanian-Italian enclaves. The physical separation of Rome and Constantinople was once again mirrored by a religious controversy centering around iconoclasm, the destruction of religious images. Three centuries following the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the Catholic Church had received many of its Germanic successor states into the faith. Where once there was Rome flanked by distant Christian realms like Armenia and Ethiopia, now there were many mighty Christian domains that rivalled the emperors in Constantinople. Chief among them was the Kingdom of the Franks, which after having defeated an Islamic invasion from Spain, established a presence in northern Italy. The Lombards destroyed the Exarchate of Ravenna, only in turn to be defeated by the Franks, who recognised the Pope for the first time as a temporal monarch in his own right, with a domain corresponding to the at of the old Exarchate. Charlemagne, upon becoming King of the Franks, would reconfirm this donation. The donated lands, the Papal States, would last until the unification of Italy, and even today exist as Vatican City. Roman emperors had assumed power in a variety of ways. The first emperor's legal authority was nominally derived from the Senate, though combined to the prestige associated with the lineage of the deified Julius Caesar and Venus Genetrix. While there are Roman dynasties, pre primogeniture was never established. Indeed, to be born to the purple, Porphyria Genitos, during an emperor's reign, was preferable to primogeniture. Succession via adoption was far more common, though peaceful succession would give way to acclamation by the army, barracks emperors, 
many men of any social rank who assumed power through military fiat. With the reforms of Diocletian, emperors would assign imperial colleagues to rule over parts of the empire. Under the Tetrarchy, there were two senior emperors, or Augustuses, and two junior emperors, or Caesars, which ultimately came to represent a Western and an Eastern emperor, and the practice of assigning co-emperors in Byzantium. Two emperors does not imply two empires, but a single imperium as represented by the eagle with two heads. Neither Odovaca nor Theodoric, two Germanic rulers of Italy, would claim the title of emperor over king, though the latter ruled over a significant part of the former Western Empire. The eagle with two heads now referred to the Eastern Roman emperor as the only Roman emperor. With Charlemagne, the situation had fundamentally changed. The Frankish kingdom was the largest state in the West since the fall of Rome, and the influence of the Eastern Roman emperors over the Pope had been supplanted by that of the Franks. Charlemagne had waged war successfully against the pagan Saxons, extending the borders of his Catholic empire to the river Elba and down to the Balkans all the while confirming the temporal sovereignty of the Pope in Rome. When Irene became the first female emperor in the East, it provided a convenient pretext for Pope Leo III to buttress his alliance with Charlemagne by conferring on him the title of Roman Emperor, given that the post was nominally vacant. Irene's Eastern or Byzantine successors would only come to acknowledge Charlemagne as an emperor, or Basileus, after a series of wars, but never recognise him as Roman emperor. This was because there had never been two separate Christian empires ruling simultaneously. The unity of the empire was meant to reflect the unity of the church and broader Christendom. Both were Catholic in the literal sense of appealing to universalism, Charlemagne was not the Western colleague of Irene's successors, in this case the Byzantine emperor Nicephorus, as both claimed this universal imperium. And so for the latter, Charlemagne was a usurper, and Pope Leo was his accomplice. Irene herself had attempted to resolve this conundrum by offering to marry Charlemagne, a scheme that failed. So now there were two Romes, existing in tandem and in competition, and ultimately with each presiding over the two major divisions of Christianity, Catholicism and Orthodoxy, the division in the empire reflecting the division in the church. As Charlemagne's imperial title was now a fait accompli, later generations would attempt to justify the change by means of the translatio imperii, or transfer of rule. As the empire was meant to be universal, so too as a reflection of the divine presence and authority on earth, the empire was meant to be eternal. Charlemagne's ascension, therefore, represents the continuation and fulfilment of the enduring idea of Rome, the temporal vice-regency of Christ, and not a breach or usurpation. Indeed, any insinuation to the contrary would be akin to blasphemy, and Charlemagne considered his ascension as a renewal of the Roman ideal, not a deviation from it. Where the first indication of holy meant Christian, with Charlemagne's coronation, I refer to the Latin sacrum, sacred, and by implication, sacramental. The sacramental aspect pertains to the power vested in the coronation ceremony itself to bestow imperium, and that imperium is bestowed by the Pope himself as Vicar of Christ. As we have seen with precedence for imperial elevation, the coronation of Charlemagne was novel in that he was Emperor Juri Pontificis by right of the Pope. Augustus's imperial rank was an amalgamation of Roman offices, one of which was Pontifex Maximus, high priest of ancient Rome. 
Though the emperors converted to Christianity, the title was still used until reworded slightly as Pontifex Inclitus under Theodosius, who acknowledged the Pope as a Pontifex also. The emperor's personal use of the title fell into abeyance with the advance of Christianity, but was never renounced. Indeed, Byzantium's emperors were Caesaropapist in the sense that their authority exceeded that of their highest-ranking prelate, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. By the time of Charlemagne's ascension, the Byzantine coronation ritual was firmly established, with an acclamation by the Senate followed by a church coronation by the patriarch in the Hagia Sophia. The republican norms of the Rome of Augustus had been fused with the traditions of medieval Christianity. In receiving his title from the Pope, Charlemagne had de facto acknowledged the Pope not merely as Pontifex, but as Pontifex Maximus, and renounced his own claim on that title, a title which would later become synonymous with the Pope. Indeed, chroniclers such as Einhardt describe Charlemagne's great reluctance to partake of the coronation, aware perhaps that if a pope can make an emperor, he can also unmake an emperor. Indeed, Charlemagne had already acknowledged the pope as king in Rome. Essentially, Charlemagne's title was contingent on the whims of an alien monarch, an alien monarch which sought a secular protector and not a master. Returning to the Wagnerian analogy, as Wotan had conceded the ring of the Nibelungen to Fafner to build Valhalla, Charlemagne had surrendered his power to the ring of the fisherman to build his Rome. Though Charlemagne made no claim on the territory of what I will now refer to as the Byzantine Empire, his Carolingian Empire was the peerless master of Western Europe, beyond which there were the petty sub-kingdoms of England and northern Spain, the Muslims to the south and pagan Slavs and Vikings to the north and east. Unfortunately for the Carolingians, they were doomed by the same disastrous policy of divided inheritance which had doomed their Frankish predecessors, the Merovingians. Charlemagne's dynasty would survive him by a single generation, save for a momentary restoration in the, 1880, in the 880s. Hence, Charlemagne's empire was a fleeting moment, yet a significant precedent in the history of the Holy Roman ideal. The crowned emperors were limited to Italy, and from the 920s began an interregnum from which it seemed unlikely that his successor to Charlemagne would ever emerge. The partition of the empire saw the creation of the first recognisable states of modern Europe, France, Germany and Italy, together with Burgundy. It was from Germany that a king would arise to reclaim the empire, Otto the Great, son of King Henry the Fowler. Having defended Europe from the great nomadic antagonists of the 10th century, the Magyars, Otto would unite Germany with Italy and receive his own papal coronation, ending a 40-year interregnum. If Charlemagne established the precedent of a Holy Roman Empire, Otto elevated that precedent into a consolidated political entity which would form the basis of the empire's subsequent history. The reigns of Otto and Otto II were the closest in realising a truly holy Roman Empire. Raised in an era of nomadic invasions, dynastic warfare and civil warfare, Otto set about to form a durable and centralised state in contradistinction to the Carolingians. Otto would ensure the succession of his son to the whole empire. Nor did the empire disintegrate when Otto III inherited the empire at the age of three. After the extinction of the Etonian line, the empire was able to peacefully transfer power over to the Salian dynasty. Had the Etonian lineage survived, it is possible that the empire would have established a permanent system of primogeniture. The church in Germany, both as an administrative body and the prime vehicle for conversion and thus expansion, was subordinated to Otto the Great through his control over religious appointments. In particular, 
royal clerks and Otto's relatives were invested as bishops in what amounted to a dependent early medieval administrative apparatus, Otto's royal chancellery. Church appointees would have authority over the secular nobility and were granted extensive tithes and their own military levies. Allowing church officials a monopoly over administrative functions and even warfare, moreover, ensured that all power reverted to the crown as all officers were non-hereditary. It was in the interest of the Etonians to sponsor the reform of the church and clerical celibacy to foster a competent and loyal administration. Regarding Rome, Otto arrived in Italy at the Ndir, both morally and politically of the papacy. Such a relative imbalance in power allowed Otto to essentially dictate terms during the period of his coronation. The diplona Ottoniamum began the process of papal reform, the papal elections, but in such a way as to recontextualise the donations of Pepin, which had confirmed the existence of the papal states. Otto had once acknowledged the Pope's independence, yet it was independence in name only, for the Emperor required the Pope's allegiance and used the Pope as a conduit to grant ecclesiastical offices. When the Pope, responsible for Otto's coronation, John XII, betrayed him, Otto removed him and appointed his own Pope with the Emperor, reserving the right to veto a papal election. The Imperial Chancellors, the Archbishops of Mainz and Cologne rivalled the prestige of the Pope as the Emperor's principal ministers and imperial vicars. The power of the Emperors would centre in Italy as they expanded southwards towards Sicily, while the legitimacy of the imperial title was bolstered by the wedding of Otto II to the Byzantine princess Theophanu. For all their accomplishments, the Etonians and their successors failed to establish a universal Christian imperium in two fundamental aspects. Firstly, whereas the Carolingians essentially owned Western Europe in the time of Charlemagne, the Europe of Henry II in the 11th century was a Europe of competing Christian nations. West Francia had been in a state of intermittent warfare with East Francia or Germany, pertaining to border disputes in the region then known as Lotharingia, corresponding to eastern France and the Low Countries. West Francia had failed to resolve its dynastic disputes, though Charlemagne's Carolingian heirs still reigned there. A prerequisite for the successor of Charlemagne would be the restoration of his Frankish empire. Otto I was able to exert great influence over West Frankish politics, yet Otto II was humiliated when Aachen, the imperial capital, was attacked by the Frankish king Lothar. Indeed, as previously stated, Atonian policy centred on Italy. West Francia consolidated under a new dynasty, the Capetians, and though Lotharingia and Burgundy were being incorporated into the empire, the Carolingian Empire would never be restored. As an heir to the Carolingian patrimony, the consequence of the separation of France from Germany and Italy was nothing short of a 1,000-year contest for European primacy, and that cannot be understated. The separation would confound all attempts at European unity from the reign of Charles the Fat to Napoleon. Beyond the question of France, there was the mass proliferation of Catholic nations in Europe. What had once been seven kingdoms was now a united English kingdom, which following the Norman conquest would become one of Europe's major powers. In Italy, the Normans, not the emperors, would successfully conquer Sicily and the south. The Byzantine Empire would conquer Bulgaria and lead a cultural conquest of the Eastern Slavs when Vladimir, Grand Prince of the Rus, converted to Orthodox Christianity. Though more significantly, the Hungarians and the Poles converted to Catholicism and would effectively bar the empire from continuing its relentless expansion eastwards, typified in the Saxon Wars, though Bohemia and later the lands of the Vens and the Swords would join the empire. Combined with the converted Christian kingdoms of Scandinavia, the Holy Roman Empire was now surrounded by rivals. 
Indeed, it was this proliferation of nations and the loss of monopoly over the appointments to the Catholic Church that created the conditions for the second point, the loss of control over the papacy. Charlemagne had established the potential for political circumvention by a rebellious pope, by the very consecration of the Holy Roman Imperial Office. Otto's attempted remedy, total integration of church and state, ultimately exacerbated this existential threat. Perhaps the conflict between the pope and the emperor could have been avoided were the papacy to have languished in a state of dependency on the Roman nobility. In other words, reducing the Pope in Rome to a localised power, rather than a universal one. For 200 years, the Pope had exchanged hands between a select group of families, most notably the Theophylactic Counts of Tusculum. Ironically, it was the reform movement instigated by the emperors that created the conditions for the investiture controversy. Emperor Henry VIII confirmed the election of Leo IX, ending the Caecalum Obscurum and the dependency of the popes on the Roman nobility. The zeal of the reforming popes was dedicated to the enforcement of clerical celibacy and of the elimination of simony, the buying and selling of ecclesiastical offices. A theological dispute over the filioque concerning the nature of Christ and the Trinity provided the catalyst for the ultimate schism between the Catholic and Orthodox churches, confirming the separation which was theological, cultural and political and had been growing for centuries. One of the documents Leo IX cited in defence of his excommunication of the Patriarch, thus precipitating the schism, was the donation of Constantine. The donation was a forged document, most likely created to aid in the negotiations of the Carolingians over the creation of the Papal States in the 8th century. It refers to various privileges granted by the Emperor Constantine to Pope Sylvester following the Edict of Milan, which began the toleration of Christians. Indeed, Pope Sylvester is noted for his various miracles and his slaying of dragons. In it, Constantine confirms the spiritual primacy of the Pope over the Patriarchy, the five major Christian bishoprics. Such primacy confirmed upon the Pope the authority to override the Ecumenical Patriarch. Yet the donation was as directed against the Holy Roman Emperor as it was against the Patriarch. The donation confirmed on the papacy the imperial regalia and temporal authority in the western half of the empire, or at least the territories in the west, or in Italy at least, from the Pope's seat in Rome. A reading of this document, which centuries after the original forgery was readily and earnestly believed, confirms the Pope's right to invest translatio imperii upon the emperors in the West. Yet contingent on the principle of jury pontificis, it would be used against the diploma Atonianum and its attempts at subordinate, subordinating a nominally independent papacy to the emperor's allegiance. From Gregory VII's Dictatus came the most serious charge against the Emperor's authority, from which they would never truly recover. Gregory claimed the Roman Imperium for the Popes, with the sole and universal authority to appoint, transfer and dismiss bishops, depose emperors and absolve subjects of their loyalty to wicked rulers. The audacity of the reforming popes was facilitated by another protracted imperial minority, this time under Henry IV, who inherited the throne at age six. An attack on the emperor's right of ecclesiastical appointments destroyed the administrative foundation of the Etonian Empire, whose chancery bishops were now papal appointees. The regency and Gregory's ability to convoke alliances against the emperor whom he had excommunicated, forced Henry IV to undergo the ritualistic penance, the walk to Canossa to receive the Pope's forgiveness in, humili in humility and ultimately as a humiliation. The investiture controversy would leave the Popes in control of the appointment of abbots and bishops, with the Emperor given the right to arbitrate. 
combined to the implications of investiture was the Pope's assumption of wartime leadership or imperium over the faithful prepared to undergo penance by taking up the cross. At the close of the 11th century, Pope Urban II called the First Crusade to reclaim the Holy Land, which succeeded in establishing crusading principalities throughout the Levant. The popes were now intimately involved in directing the global defence and indeed expansion of Christendom. By the time we arrive at the conflict of the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, the partisans of the Pope and the Hohenstaufen emperors who followed on from the Salian emperors, the battle lines, the competing notions of universalism, were already well established. What threats Henry IV faced from his vassals increased exponentially under Frederick Barbarossa in his war against Henry the Lion, desperately attempting to preserve an increasingly feudalistic empire, while, by that same token, the cities of Italy revolted against and successfully defied imperial authority in the Lombard League. Barbarossa's attempt at harnessing Christendom's crusading spirit under the Emperor's direction ended disastrously and anticlimactically at the Salaf River. Frederick II Hohenstaufen would lead the imperial contest again, this time from Palermo. Despite presiding over the most centralised state in Europe, dare I say, modern state in Europe, against a papacy that referred to him as the Antichrist, Frederick II would fail in his attempt to bring imperial rule to Italy. His dynasty would not only fail, but be exterminated. His grandson Conradin was the victim of regicide. The Hohenstaufen lands in Swabia underwent an aggressive process of dissolution, leaving the region as one of the most decentralised in Europe. The 13th century began as a contest between two de facto Holy Roman Empires, the Papacy and the Imperial House of Hohenstaufen. By the 14th century, both powers were in ruins. Perhaps the greatest irony of all was in the zeal of the popes to defeat the Hohenstaufens. They fell victim to an accidental translatio imperii. The Capetian dynasty of France were allies of the papacy. Under papal direction, the Capetian house of Anjou conquered Sicily, and increasingly, writs of excommunication coincided with the demands of French foreign policy. The papacy would lose its independence, and even the city of Rome, as puppets in Avignon, emperor's de facto emperor, Philip IV of France, presiding over the papacy's capture. Thus began the empire's long interregnum, and the papacy's Babylonian captivity. Can we say that this moment, the empire lost all pretension to being holy, Roman, or an empire? The 14th and 15th centuries were a struggle internally for the empire, a contest between rival dynasties. And indeed, this was over a politically defined system, a legalised anarchy. Nevertheless, emperors were crowned. Indeed, under Emperor Sigismund, the Avignon papacy and as many as two other rival papacies in Rome and Pisa were reconciled and returned to Rome with the election of a single pope, Martin V, ending the Western Schism. Following the death of Sigismund, the fortunes of the House of Habsburg would radically redefine the empire's prospects. Under Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor ruled over domains that eclipsed Charlemagne and had the potential to unite Christendom once more, with the Protestant Revolution providing the impetus for a general reformation of the Church under the Emperor's direction. The Catholic reform movement was instead led by the papacy. The Emperor was militarily defeated by the Protestants, and despite all the wealth of the New World being brought to bear, a century of conflict would leave the Emperors reigning over a divided Empire, both politically and religiously, thanks to the Peace of Augsburg and the Peace of Westphalia. The House of Habsburg would to continue its decline throughout the 18th century, to the point of having to share authority in Germany with the Protestant Calvinist Kingdom of Prussia, what is called German dualism. 
Towards the end of the 15th century, the Emperor Maximilian had led a process known as Reich's Reform. Combined to the acknowledgement of the anarchy in Charles IV's Golden Bull, the Empire assumed a definitively decentralised structure, more or less consistent with German-speaking lands and their immediate environs. Occasionally, the usage of the title Holy Roman Emperor was substituted for the Holy Roman Emperor of the German nation, though rarely. After the abdication of Charles V, no emperor would be directly crowned by the Pope, reflected in their new title of elected emperor, as opposed to crowned emperor, the coronation being that of the King of the Romans in Frankfurt. Though the religious wars had torn Germany apart, the Thirty Years' War had resulted in millions of deaths, and the military intervention of the empire's more powerful neighbours. Despite this, the Treaty of Westphalia, the fragile peace in its aftermath, held. Indeed, the horrors of war and religious conflict created a strange inertia regarding the fate of the empire and its institutions, which survived the Prussian Wars, as Frederick the Great was content to remain a part of the imperial structure rather than destroy it. The fall of Constantinople to the Turks had left the much weakened Holy Roman Empire as the sole Christian imperial authority for the first time. Where the Habsburgs failed in Germany, they succeeded against the Ottomans, leading the last crusade from the gates of Vienna to the fortress of Belgrade. There, the Habsburgs established a new empire on the Danube, which gave added credence to their near monopoly over the imperial title, and their ability to hold a position of primus inter paris, the first monarch among equals in Europe, even against the encroachments and the ambitions of the French. Indeed, it was a privilege that was jealously guarded. When Peter the Great of Russia changed his formal title from Tsar to Emperor, the Austrian Habsburgs would not acknowledge it were it to imply equality with the Holy Roman Emperor, as the Ottoman Kaiser of Rome, from its occupation of Constantinople, was known in Europe simply as the Turkish Sultan. The impact of the Empire's end, coinciding with the advance of the French Revolution, produced a similar psychological effect to that of the original coronation of Charlemagne and the ramifications for broader Christendom. Napoleon was Alexander, cutting through the Gordian knot, or Siegfried, breaking Wotan's spear, and with it the ancient and even contradictory set of laws and obligations that had constrained Wotan's will to the point of paralysis if one needed a perfect analogy for the end of the empire. Except Napoleon conquered and then lost Europe in a single decade, despite all of his Carolingian and Roman pretensions. There was no glorious Bonaparte-esque translatio imperii. Napoleon was a false Charlemagne. With the end of the Holy Roman Empire, the translatio imperii, in a very informal and much diminished sense, was conferred on the Habsburgs. Europe's Catholic rather than Roman emperors. The symbolic currency of the Habsburg emperors would wane, a broader indictment on the relative decline of Austria and then Austria-Hungary. Perhaps the last dramatic act in the imperial papal saga was Emperor Franz Josef's use of the Jus Exclusive, or veto, against the election of Cardinal Mariano Rampolla as Pope in the, conflict of 19, in the conclave of 1903. The First World War was responsible for dethroning the last Catholic emperor, the last Orthodox emperor, and by a novel coincidence, the last Muslim caliph. Throughout the medieval era, up until the 16th century, a certain eschatology was predicated around the four kingdoms of Daniel. The fourth kingdom was the Holy Roman Empire. With the fall of the Holy Roman Empire and its echo in the Empire of Austria was supposed to herald the end of the world and the coming of Christ. It is important to consider whether the failure of the eternal empire, the ultimate confounding of the Translatio Imperii, the fall of the fourth empire, and with it the concurrent triumphs of secularism and socialism, marks the final transition from Christianity to post-Christianity in Europe. 
an additional note to viewers of the channel. I understand that my output has been relatively sporadic recently, but I'd like to assure you that there will now be a video or a stream with guests every Friday from now on at nine o'clock. Sometimes the time will vary. Thank you very much for listening.